morning. I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of September 9th. Um, we have uh, hospital budget board deliberations today. We'll have staff presentations on Northwestern, Brattleboro, Northeastern, Springfield, UVM, CVMC, and Porter. Um, those will be led by Ms. Barabee and her staff. Um, the first agenda item is a notice of recusal, which I'll provide. Uh, Dr. Dave Merman is a physician at CVMC, and he is going to uh, recuse himself. Um, and he's provided notice of his recusal from the CVMC deliberations and vote. Um, and so in connection with that recusal, he will step out during the CVMC presentation by staff, and then uh, he'll return for the uh, Porter deliberations. Um, and with that, I'll turn it to our attorney, Mark Hengstler, for a presentation of the standard budget order conditions. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, Elena, do you want to pull up slides? Yeah. Let me just stick with the with the single deck. Yeah, I appreciate it. Great. Okay. So good morning, everybody. I'm back to talk about fiscal year 25 standard budget conditions. This is following a discussion we had last week where I went over proposed language. And what we decided to do was to come back today. And I said I would do one thing, which I did, and then I did another thing as well. So first, I said that I would mark any of the budget conditions that were new to this year, which I've done. Those are marked in red. And then after some more consideration and looking back at past orders, I also added a few items that were not here last week, and I've marked those in blue. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to describe the blue stuff, which is new. I'm going to describe the, the red stuff, which was here last week, but not clearly uh, new to fiscal year 25. And then if board members have any questions about any of these, we can we can discuss and go through. I will just state to make this very clear, especially for any hospitals looking at this, that the there are going to be some small language changes in some of these conditions that are that are still in black. I have not gone through and made changes to what I view as minor small language differences between FY24. Um, hospitals certainly are welcome to take a close look at their past budget orders in this one if that's something they'd like to do. But um, just for the sake of having a record that's clean to look at, I've, I've really only marked the items that are um, new, new conditions that are being proposed as additions for the board to consider. With that in mind, one item on the top, which is item A, I noticed that in prior years, we've used both net patient revenue to describe the NPR cap. And I've seen us also used NPR slash FPP, meaning net patient revenue and fixed perspective payments. I saw some instances of using either NPR or NPR FPP in different parts of old budget order conditions. So just to kind of simplify, this to the extent it would cause any confusion. What I've done up top is I've just written NPR FPP and then in uh, parentheses noted that when we're referring to NPR anywhere, we're referring to a hospital's net patient revenue and inclusive in that net patient revenue, we're referring to fixed perspective payments, which of course are payments derived from uh, patient care. So just to be clear that when we're talking about NPR, we're talking about both as has historically been the case as far as I'm aware. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, item C is a new item. So I'll read the new items. Uh, item C was in some budget order language in prior years. I included it again just so we have utmost clarity for everybody. And this is an item that is intended to make very clear that the commercial rate cap that is described in the uh, in paragraph B is a maximum and is subject to negotiation between the hospital and commercial insurers. This condition requires that a hospital shall not represent that the maximum commercial rate increase approved by the board or the um, expected commercial NPR are amounts that are set or guaranteed by the GMCB, meaning this is a, a cap. It's not a guarantee of a of a specific rate. It is the most 
that are at the highest a rate can go. It's a cap. So that was there last year, I, I believe, but I just wanted to put it back in this year so that we have that clarity. Um, next one is item E. This was here last week, but it is a new item, so I've marked it in red. This is a requirement that hospitals shall file an updated rate decomposition sheet with the board no more than 30 days after FY25 contracts have been finalized with commercial payers. I think that one is pretty self-explanatory. And then item F is also new. So thinking about the rate decomposition sheet that we used for the first time this year, one observation staff made was that not all hospitals could break out payer specific revenue reporting at the level of detail that would allow us to get complete apples to apples uniform accounting from hospitals. So this requirement is a requirement that is about ensuring that all hospitals can report one collect and then to report on data in the same way so that we get the same information across all of the rate decomposition sheets that we get for hospitals. And again, these are sheets that are designed to help us understand hospitals budgets in regard to rate and volume. So this is a requirement that says that a hospital shall make any necessary changes to its methods of data collection such that it can report revenues segmented by the following payer types starting FY25. Here are the payer types. One, Medicare, two, Medicare Advantage, three, Medicaid, four, commercial health insurance, five, Vermont specific commercial payers, six, non Vermont commercial payers, and seven, all other payers, for example, self pay, workers' comp, et cetera, for which data collection and reporting may be combined. The GMCB shall provide definitions for each payer type by October 1st, 2024, so hospitals can uniformly implement this change. And uh, Lena, if you could go to the next slide, please. I think the next one's got nothing new in it. So this is all same that you saw last week. Nothing here is new substantively from FY24. And then on to the next slide, which I also think is all uh, relatively unchanged. Again, there might be some, some minor language edits in here, but uh, no new conditions. And then the next slide, Elena, please, which is the last one. So the only other one here that I'm highlighting is one that was presented last week, but is new to this year. And this is item Q. Hospital shall report on any changes it makes to the methods it uses to calculate information it reports to the GMCB. Any such report shall include a detailed explanation as to the reason for the change and the inclusion of a comparison report that shows the results using the hospital's prior method of calculation. This is a condition that is intended to provide the board with uh, a, a, a information from a hospital when methods of calculating info have changed so that if we're getting, let's say, the same report uh, throughout the year and one item in that report now is, is being calculated in a new way, we just get a heads up from the hospital to understand that the calculation that they're using has changed and then second, have a comparison report so we can see what the impact of that change is on, on what we're getting. And if you can go to the next slide, Elena, that's that's it for the changes to budget order conditions. So with that in mind, this is suggested motion language for moving to uh, uh, incorporate these, these budget order conditions into hospital orders. The board can, I think I think two two things both are fine. Um, so the board could either take up this motion today, table it, and then vote on the eleventh. Or if the board wants additional time, it would also be fine, in, in my opinion, to wait until the eleventh, uh, bring the motion up then, uh, but and then table it until the thirteenth. So either way, I would just ask that we uh, either do it. Bring it up today if we want to potentially vote on it on the 11th or bring it up at the latest on the 11th so we can vote on it on the 13th. Um, and with that, I'll turn it to you, Chair Foster, so you can move us through that section. Thank you very much. Um, I think I will make this motion. Um, as with all the motions on hospital budgets this year, I do want more time for public comment and feedback. So I'll make the motion so that there can be public comment on this motion. Um, oh, but before, can I, oh, sorry. 
I have ahead, some Robin. comments on the standard conditions. Would you like me to make those before you move or after? Um, we can do it either. Uh, well, they're suggested about... changes, so it might make, if other people are okay with it, it might make sense to do it, do the motion after. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do neither? And you can send Mark your suggested edits offline and he can work on them and see if um, they make sense to the staff. And if they do, he can put them in and we can bring them back up and we can take this up at the end of the day. Does that work? Okay, sure. Okay. All right, so I won't make this motion yet and um, Member Lund or other members can send Mark any comments they may have for, for any tweaks. And then Mark, you can... Um, Deal with them during a break if you have a chance, and we can bring this up later. Um, I will make a motion, though, to as we did with the uh, other hospital budget um, motions to to table them all for today. And again, that's to allow additional um, time for public comment on each of the hospital motions. So again, today there'll be a series of motions that are presented, moved, potentially seconded. And then there'll be an open public comment period on all those motions. And on the Wednesday and Friday, we will then untable the motions and take them up. So with that, I hereby move to table all future motions made on hospital budgets, enforcement, or standard budget conditions until September 11th or 13th to allow for additional public comment on the motions and potential board decisions. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Um, and the motion carries and all motions will be tabled, but public comment is open for any motions made today or last week. Um, and with that, I will turn it to Ms. Barabee. Thank you. Um, okay. All right, so this is, um, I think there were some questions. I'm going to dive right in. I have one more follow up um, and then we'll get into the hospital specifics. But board members had asked how the staff recommendations compare to projected. And I thought it would be good to kind of give an overview. And there's a lot of information here, so I'll walk you through it slowly. Um, so to go back in time, I think, you know, we really need to think about 2022. So in 2022, we set guidance for FY 23 and 24, and the board established a two-year rate of 8.6%. Um, and then kind of considering those, they, considering that guidance, you went through and you made decisions about NPR growth for 23, you established a budget, and then we are now evaluating that budget for enforcement. Um, and then there's 24 still in progress, but we have these projected numbers, and so we can kind of look at what that looks like. So FY24 budget to FY23, so this is what you approved. You approved an 8.6% system-wide increase in NPR for one year. Um, then if you look at FY24 projected to FY24 budget, you can see at the system-wide we're at 1.7% over. So far, this is um, 24, so it's our current year. This is based on what hospitals reported to us on July 1st, which means that these data are from kind of earlier this year. So this could be higher than that if they've been trending hotter than expected or lower than that if they've been coming under. So this, you know, this number could change, but this is what we had um, per the budget submissions. If we look at this 24 projected versus 23 budget, if we kind of trend, you know, allow this growth to kind of continue forward and roll that into the 25 decisions, that would mean that you've accepted a 10.3% growth in system wide NPR. So that means that over 24 projected to comparing that to FY22 budget, remember we set this 8.6% growth rate for those two years, we would be essentially allowing almost 18% growth in our system. So I just want to walk through that. Um, and then if you look at our recommendation versus 24, we're currently recommending 2.2% over where we were. Any questions? Uh, yeah, just a couple of clarifying ones for me and then I'll turn to the others. Um, so we had uh, um, rough, roughly $100 million in fiscal year 23 variation from budget orders. Is that incorporated in these numbers? 
I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? The for, for fiscal year 23, we have somewhere around $100 million in, in variation from the caps. Is that $100 million overage incorporated in these numbers? Yes, so that where you would see FY20, well, FY23 actuals is not in. No, I could add that in as well. So that would that would add additional growth. Yeah. Okay, right. Because budget to project it. Right, so okay. Right. Yep, yep. You're right. I but missed this, that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but you do have But 24. I have projected to 22, right? So that's the two year. That would be so that 17.9% is what's comparable to the 8.6% you initially set out in guidance, right? We know that changed because the you allowed a different growth rate, but that I, it's just a comparison point. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's all I wanted yeah. to know is whether or not that extra 100 million was in here or not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Nothing else from me. Okay. Oh. I'm not, I'm not able to understand you, Dave. I'll just say one thing while you're fixing your your audio, hopefully. Um, I just wanted to call out the box on the lower right. Um, you know, these are projections, but we don't actually get 24 actuals submitted until early in the next year. So just in terms of thinking about the timeline, so we won't kind of understand potential enforcement and rationale and kind of letting the year close out until then. Okay. All right. Dave, do you want to talk? Oh, I can hear you. Now. All right, I got audio. Okay. We can get the FY24 pen uh, projected versus uh, FY22 budget number there, the 17.9%, uh, but also the $646 million. Is that the total over two years, or that's the 24 projected annual versus the 22 budget annual? That's the delta between 24 projected and FY22 budget. Okay. So in that, the FY24 projected annual budgets are $646 million over the FY22 budgeted year. Accurate. Yes, that's what that means. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay. If we don't have any other questions on this, I'll keep going. Um, I believe I'm turning it over. Is it Noah? Are you first up? Yep, I'm first up. So we'll follow a similar um, approach to Friday and we'll be trading off. Um, so Noah, take it away. Okay, are we taking comment right now or are we gonna wait till after after the presentation? Um, I just saw a hand raised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Why don't we, so this is a different topic. I don't mind taking, Mr. Del Trecker, if you have a comment, now's fine on that. Great, great, thank you, I appreciate it. I thought that um, the two year was Anchor to fiscal year 22 actual, not budget, in the guidance. Like, no, um, I can pull that up for you. It's 22 budget. I actually copied this directly from the guidance, so it was 22 budget. And and then the other comment that I would make is, um, and I and I keep making this comment. There's volume and there's price, driving these things, and. It's really important to know what part is the price and what part is the volume, but I, but, um, and I, and I, and I, I'm almost certain that it's fiscal year 22 actual, but we can, you can look at that and I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I pulled it straight from the guidance last night. So, um, but we can, I can pull it up and we can look at it at lunchtime. Um, it is certainly budget. Um, but we can well, keep moving. Yeah. Well, let me let me interrupt just for a second, um, Mr. Del Trecco, If you have something like a note you want to send to us, uh, for you know that that that'd be helpful just to make sure we have it right, and then we can take a look at it. Great, thank you. And then second, um, just so the record is clear, um, Miss Barbie, this is just revenue. It's price and volume, right? So Mr. Del Trecco's point was some of this could be price, some of it could be volume, but what we're looking at is what people have to pay. It's the it's the it's the total. Yes. So people pay <clears throat> your premiums are a function of price and volume. So that's why it's important to think about both components. And then just again for clarity, but this isn't just premiums. This is Medicare, Medicaid, yes. and commercial. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. 
and I would just comment to say, um, if if volume is driving that, how do how do we um, recognize that we're taking care care of people? This is delivering care to Vermonters. It's not arbitrary. It's not a price hike. It's caring for people showing up at our at our hospitals. So it's just an interesting discussion. What what are the drivers behind this and why? So thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the comment. Um, Ms. Bear Noah, Mr. Monter Moreno, you can carry on if you'd like. All right. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just as a reminder to everybody, this is part two of our two part overview of hospital budgets. Um, we presented part one on Friday. Um, you can find that video now, I believe, on our YouTube channel if you want to go back and listen. Um, I'll be assuming some background knowledge from Friday's presentation, but otherwise on this first presentation, I'll go a bit slower so people can get reacclimated to the slides. Um, today we'll be presenting on the second seven hospitals. Those I believe are Northwestern, Brattleboro, NVRH, Springfield, and the three um, UVM Health Network hospitals. Um, and can you all hear me okay? Owen, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so I'll start with Northwestern um, and then I'll switch off to other members of the team. Um, as a reminder, there are three central components to a hospital budget submission and PR growth, commercial revenue growth, operating margin. Um, we set benchmarks for each. Uh, Northwestern came in over benchmarks for NPR and commercial uh, rate growth. That's 6.8% and 6.4%. Um, as a system overage over guidance, that's a 3% overage for NPR and a 6% overage for commercial rate. That's a percentage of the entire system's request over guidance. Um, next slide. So uh, to justify their higher request for both NPR and for commercial rate, um, the hospital provided three justifications to us. Um, as a reminder, it's the hospital's responsibility to justify any time they make higher requests. Um, these we highlighted from their narrative as well as their budget presentation. Um, they're not comprehensive, they're just the main ones. Um, the first, uh, Northwestern argued, is that they're high productivity. Um, they provided productivity reports from Premier um, in their narrative, uh, which ranks individual apart, uh, departments. That's in page five of their narrative. Uh, their second justification is that they have low operating costs. Um, including low average operating costs per adjusted patient discharges. Uh, this is in page six of their narrative. And their third um, is that they need to address long wait times. Um, and they cite key outpatient services where they're trying to sort of expand access to care and uh, tamp those wait times a bit down. Uh, so just keep in mind these three justifications as we proceed to sort of examine some of their budget data. Next slide. So we'll start by looking at their revenue trends over the last few years. Um, as you can see, there's been a significant increase in commercial revenues over the last few years from about 50 million in uh, fiscal year 2018 to a budgeted about 80 million uh, in fiscal year 25. Uh, meanwhile, public revenues have been uh, relatively flat. There's been a slight increase in Medicare from 33.6 million to 37.6, and Medicaid revenues have actually been decreasing from 19 million to about 15 million. And on the right, you'll see a greater level of detail. Um, we're not going to delve into all the detail today, but if uh, people want to uh, look at this presentation later, look at these slides, we'll, we'll post it all out for the public. Uh, next slide. Uh, this slide uh, indicates it, it conveys their budgeted uh, revenues versus their actual revenues. Uh, the red negative values can indicate when actuals were uh, lower than budget, whereas the black indicates when actuals were higher than budget. Uh, as you can see, actuals were consistently lower, which means they over budgeted revenues. Um, there are particularly large shortfalls for their commercial revenues. You can see in fiscal year 2022, uh, a 10.5% shortfall. In 23, a 15.7% shortfall. Um, this came in, and if you look at the total on the bottom of the uh, table, um, somewhat significant shortfalls year over year. 
and we'll take um, comments at the end. Um, this uh, conveys their commercial revenue trends year over year, um, the cumulative NPR growth from uh, 2018 to budget of 2025, as well as the change in charge. Um, this is the change in charge year over year. It's not cumulative change in charge. So in fiscal year 2021, uh, they had a 13% change in charge, 2022, 3%, and you see it, it fluctuates up and down a bit, um, but mostly been above 3.4% year over year. Next slide. Um, so this slide is to dive a little bit deeper into their expense trends. Um, Northwestern has successfully kept their uh, growth rate of expenses below the Vermont average. Um, and mostly below 4%. Um, for 2025, they're expecting a slight uptick to about 4.1%. Um, we can see a breakout of the expenses a bit more on the right-hand side. Um, labor's increased very slightly from uh, fiscal year 2023 to 2024. On the bottom right, uh, you can see their uh, budgeted versus actual uh, or actual and predicted expense trends. Um, you can see they underestimated labor expenses for both 23 and 24. Um, in their narrative, they attribute this to employee health insurance claims coming in higher than budget and other factors. Uh, for other non-salary expenses, they came in slightly under budget with the exception of 23. Um, in their narrative, they also explain that traveler expense has also been a, a large overage in their budget, but it's it's been decreasing over time. Next slide. So uh, from 24 projected to 25 budget, um, they're increasing uh, some FTEs, uh, but as they explained, they're really focused on increasing FTEs in clinical positions um, and actually decreasing their FTEs in non-clinical positions. Uh, they've written that they're, they're really focused on expanding staff among licensed nursing assistants um, and in certain clinical service areas, uh, such as cardiology, ENT, orthopedics, pulmonology, urology, um, we'll get into this a bit later as we discuss their, their access concerns. Next slide. Um, so this is a summary slide depicting their operating margins on the left side, as well as their revenue and expense overages or under estimates on the right hand side. Um, as you all can see, they've fallen short, significantly short on their operating margin in past years, um, significantly below the Vermont average. Um, they're projected to improve in 2024, but still fall about $1 million short from breaking even. Um, and they hope to return to a 1% operating margin in, in 2025. Uh, if you look to the right-hand side, uh, you can see there's no real clear pattern in their operating revenue overages. Um, in 2022, they were under budgeting. In 2023, they were uh, over budgeting. Uh, 2024 is coming in slightly over budget at 1.1%. Uh, from their income statement, this appears to be from increased outpatient care revenue uh, with a small bump in swing bed revenue as well. Uh, they contextualize this in their narrative, which speaks to increased operating room hours, rehab services, uh, and outpatient diagnostic imaging. Um, operating expenses, if you continue to look at the right hand side, uh, historically come in over budget. Um, in 2024, they've decreased this overage from to about 3% from 7.2% in 2022. Um, so overall, it appears that consistently expense overages have outpaced their revenue or overages or shortfalls, um, which has contributed to significant deficits over the years, but they're uh, aiming to close that in 2024 and 2025. Next slide. Um, this is a summary of their uh, financial health as it relates to three metrics, their operating margin, their total margin, uh, and their EBITDA. Um, as you can see, they struggled uh, in past years uh, to post a positive operating margin, what we discussed in the last slide, um, particularly in 2022, um, because their other operating revenues were, were in the negative. Um, this was common for a lot of hospitals, particularly in sort of recovery period from COVID. 
um, and they've relied on their total margin uh, in 2023 and 2024, um, hoping to uh, post a positive operating margin for the first time uh, next year. Next slide. Um, so now we'll discuss certain financial health metrics. Um, on the left, you can see a graph of their day's cash on hand. Um, there's some debate over what a healthy minimum level of day's cash on hand would be, but um, for this presentation, we've settled on 100 days. Uh, and on the right side, their patient account receivable, which is uh, an indication of their cash flow. Um, so as you can see, their day's cash on hand is between 200 and 250 days, which is in a very healthy range. Um, and their PAR has been uh, hovering about in the average range, so nothing too concerning there. Uh, this slide displays their current ratio, included fund, including funded depreciation, as well as their current ratio, excluding funded depreciation. Um, in general, uh, we'd want to see a ratio between 1.5 to 3. Um, the average for hospitals in the U.S. is 2.79. The median value is 1.7. Um, they're well above these values um, in both graphs. So, again, nothing too concerning here. Next slide. Um, their average age of plant is on the higher end of the spectrum, um, uh, creeping towards the 75th percentile. Um, Northwestern's also acknowledged in the narrative that their capital expenditures have lagged uh, depreciation expenses in recent years, uh, which indicates that their equipment and infrastructure replacements are not keeping up uh, with the need for those replacements. Next slide. Uh, and final two metrics, um, as it relates to their financial health, their long-term debt to capitalization and their debt service coverage ratio. Uh, long-term debt to capitalization shows how much financial leveraging a firm has, uh, meaning the use of its debt to finance growth or acquire other assets. Um, the uh, DSCR measures a firm's available cash flow to pay its debt obligations. Uh, on the left, uh, they look healthy. Uh, we'd want to see at a maximum uh, long-term debt below 50%, they're now around 12.5 uh, to 15%. On the right, um, the minimum ratio for lenders is about 1.25, sometimes it's closer to 1.4, and they look like they're above two at the moment. Um, just for your own clarity of mind, the graph on the left, lower values are better, graph on the right, higher values are better. I know it can be confusing to see them uh, side by side like this. Um, next slide. So summary of their financial health. I think general theme is that it's, it seems strong. It seems very good, um, with the exception of, of very concerning operating margins in uh, recent years. Uh, we've seen gradual improvement there. Uh, their day's cash on hand is high. Um, PAR is in the average performance range. Current ratio well above the U.S. median. Age of plant, um, a little bit concerning as they approach the 75th percentile, especially with uh, funded depreciation, um, so something to monitor going forward. Uh, Long-term debt to capitalization is good, and um, we'd want to see their debt service coverage ratio uh, stabilize above the minimum level, which is 1.25 or, or 1.4. Next slide. Um, this is indication of their RAND prices. Um, on average, Northwestern seems to be fairly low priced. Um, their outpatient standardized price is average on the national level, level, but we've seen higher prices in Vermont, so it actually makes them a relatively low price for Vermont. Um, and their inpatient prices are, are lower within the second uh, and first uh, price decile. If you look to the left, um, their relative price is a bit higher. Um, this suggests that their um, payments from Medicare are a little less favorable, which makes sense because they're not a critical access hospital, but still still fairly low, lower than we see with a lot of Vermont hospitals. Next slide. The next few slides get into some of their budget assumptions um, relating to public payer prices, volumes, and other issues. Um, so we asked explicitly in their narrative uh, what they assumed for Medicare and Medicaid reimbursements for this year. 
Um, uh, in their narrative, they suggested that they'd receive a 1.7% increase from Medicare and 0% increase from Medicaid. Um, from their workbook, a little bit different. They said 0% for Medicare, 0% for Medicaid. Um, so a little bit of a discrepancy there, but the board can dive into that if they if they like. Next slide. Um, this uh, depicts their volume assumptions. On the left, we have their payer mix, which is uh, the revenue they earn from respective insurance plans. Uh, as you can see, mostly commercial, about 61%. Um, a lower amount Medicare, Medicare traditional, Medicare Advantage, about 29%, and a lower amount Medicaid. On the right, um, a little bit of a different metric. It's not payer mix. It's uh, predicted changes to volume. And this we lifted from their workbook. So it's what they provided to us. Um, and Northwestern is predicting pretty significant increases to their volume, uh, particularly commercial volume, Medicare Advantage volume, around 9%. Um, as a reminder, they're requesting a 6.8% increase in NPR, um, attributing a very large amount of volume, which aligns with part of their justifications, which is to increase access in certain outpatient service areas. Next slide. Uh, so this displays data from 2021 to 2023, 2024. Um, it's to measure uh, how their projected uh, revenue aligns to their actual revenue, which they report to us about a year later, sometime later. Um, as you can see, projections were a little bit off for 2021, but much closer for 2022 and 2023. Um, we saw a slight under prediction of public payer revenues, which is concerning because that can sometimes lead to higher commercial rate asks than are necessary. Um, but otherwise, nothing too concerning. As Robin pointed out in the past meeting, um, there are also some um, strange things going on with this period too. So we want to keep that in mind and not extrapolate too much. Next slide. Uh, this is a brief overview of their budget history, um, where they received approvals, uh, where they received adjustments, and how their actuals came in uh, next to those things. Uh, as for their revenues, um, all years their requests were approved, except for 2021, where they experienced a, a slight cut. Um, in operating expenses, again, uh, all their requests were approved with the exception of uh, 2020. Um, expenses typically came in a little higher than budget, as we uh, discussed previously, with the exception of 2020. Um, and their operating revenues also uh, mostly approved, uh, as we discussed before. They've they've struggled with their operating revenues um, because expense overages have been higher than they anticipated. Next slide. This is a aggregate of a bunch of efficiency metrics. Um, the first clinical productivity data they provided to us. The rest is all from NASHP. Um, we used to spread this out into a bunch of slides. We want to condense it. So there's a lot of information here, a lot to dig into. It's just to give you all a sense of where their efficiency might lie. Um, so clinical productivity, as a reminder, this was a core justification of their budget. They provided a lot of detail in their narrative, more than most hospitals, on how they measure clinical productivity. Um, and it seems like they have a somewhat rigorous uh, method for evaluating clinical uh, productivity on the departmental level. Um, if you want to dive into that, that's on page five of their narrative posted publicly on our website. Um, they also provided uh, clinical productivity data to us, um, which shows that certain departments are very low. 80.1% of what they reported to us is below the 50th percentile, which is a little bit concerning. Um, but we're not exactly sure how comprehensive that data might be. So clinical productivity data, a mixed bag, a little complicated, but I'd suggest that people dive into the narrative for a little bit more detail. Um, otherwise, uh, the NASHP metrics um, suggest lower levels of efficiency. Um, they have a higher Medicare cost per discharge. Um, Medicare payment to cost ratio is 72%. Um, their NPR per discharge is higher than the Vermont median um, over the period between 2018 and 2022. And their admin to clinical salary ratio is also a bit higher. Um, 
some of this data is a little dated. Uh, it's from NASHP, so we're lifting from 2022 as our most recent year. So take it with a grain of salt, but hopefully informative in, in some ways. Um, and on the right, just as a reminder, the three main hospital justifications for this budget, um, their productivity, their low costs, and their need to address uh, long wait times. Uh, next slide. I added one more slide here on their third justification, um, which was their need to address long wait times. Um, this was a significant part of their budget narrative. Um, they've posted uh, detailed visit lag information and uh, posted detail in their narrative about how they really um, expect to expand access in these different outpatient services. Um, and many of these services, they've since hired staff, um, filled vacancies that were outstanding. Um, other services, they're planning to hire staff. Um, it was too much to put all on this one slide, but I've put some summary figures on how much they're expecting or hoping to increase access over the uh, next year. Um, and uh, if you want more detail there, I suggest you dive into the narrative. Uh, that should be on pages four to five of their budget narrative. And next slide. That's it for me. So I believe I'll pass it off to Mark or Elena for the suggested motion language. Um, Unless there are any I, questions, right? Yeah, I, I can take it. Any board member questions or comments? Um, I'll make the motion. Um, I move to approve NMC's budget with modifications as follows. With fiscal year 25, NPR approved at a growth rate of not more than 6% over its fiscal year 24 approved budget, reduced from 6.8%, and a commensurate reduction in operating expenses. With fiscal year 25, commercial change in charge and negotiated rate growth capped at 3.4% over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap, reduced from 6.4% with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount and subject to all other standard budget conditions as approved by this board. A second. Any other board discussion at this time? Healthcare advocate. And we have comment. no comments at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, uh, sorry, thank you. Uh, and public comment via raise the hand function. Uh, Mr. Wright, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to comment, Chair Foster. I have to say that we're disappointed to see the board make a decision that will not only have a negative impact on the health and well-being of the residents of Franklin and Grand Isle counties, but will also most certainly have a direct opposite impact of your desired goal to help lower the insurance costs for the people of Vermont. Um, reducing NMC's rate increase from 3.4% may create a sense of fa fairness and uh, inequality, uh, but we believe the board must consider equity as each hospital is starting from a, a different position. If you refer back to my comments uh, in the budget presentation where I pointed out a 3% increase on someone charging $100 for a service is a lot different than a 3% increase for someone charging $50 for, uh, for a service. We certainly appreciate the complexity of this situation and I urge you actually not to move forward um, with this motion. This motion represents, in, in our estimates, a bit of an easy way out by uniformly applying a cap on rate increases without considering the sufficient and credible evidence that NMC provided during its budget presentation. According to the um, Green Mountain Care Board's own data, NMC has the lowest rate for outpatient service, the second lowest rate for inpatient services. So we're already starting from low dollars, right? So you're just as I said before, you're you're capping a rate increase on something that's already low. So the same rate increase for us compared to a different hospital in Vermont yields a very different impact. NMC's um, is below the national average and the Vermont average for cost per adjusted discharge. Um, that is uh, according to the um, 
I think it's the NASHP data, uh, NMC, NMC's rate increase since the inception of the Green Mountain Care Board. So going all the way back to, I believe it was 2011, is 3.87%, the lowest of all Vermont hospitals. According to your source, the National Academy for State Health Policy, NMC's cumulative operating expense growth over the last five years alone is the lowest in the state while maintaining the strongest focus on direct patient uh, our, our our focus on how much we spend on direct patient labor uh, amongst our peers. Um, this is a direct result of your encouragement from the Green Mountain Care Board to have NMC focus on expanding access. Uh, the gentleman earlier spoke about the, the added increases in staffing costs directly related to new providers and the support staff needed uh, for those providers. By the way, there was some uh, productivity data about provider specific that he was making mention to. And I would point out that when our providers have a lower productivity, they also carry a lower salary. So um, we match productivity against base salary and we make appropriate um, salary adjustments. So we are acting responsible in that vein. In the last five years alone, our, two, our total cumulative operating expense um, has only been uh, uh, has only increased 17.5 percent. Again, that's the lowest in Vermont, with the next closest hospital being 42.8 percent higher than that, according to the Green Mountain Care Board data. Again, lower costs for uh, NMC. So I would encourage you to consider all of this in comparison to, you know, the expense worth. Uh, Chair Foster, just as we spoke when you were here visiting, you know, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board's expense and, and the percentage of increases over the years, right? We've, and not to say that as a stab towards the Green Mountain Care Board, but that operating pressures on every single organization in healthcare and outside of healthcare have been great. And yet repeatedly, Northwestern Medical Center has come significantly below um, it, its peers and, and across the state of Vermont and the nation um, as a result of trying to be very focused on appropriate um, uh, and prudent expenses. Um, our, our rate increases related to labor have been in a very competitive labor market with healthcare uh, expenditures for our staff. We obviously, when our staff gets sick, we have no choice but to support them and we always would. Um, increases have come in salaries to maintain a competitiveness, competitiveness in the market and that maintaining of competitiveness has actually dropped the use of travelers as was mentioned earlier. Moving forward with your motion, um, it, it will result in yet another negative operating margin. By the way, we have negative operating margins going all the way back to 2017. In 2016, we submitted a rate increase of 0%. The Green Mountain Care Board dropped our rate increase uh, by 8%, resulting in subsequent years of um, negative operating margins. Um, so uh, our, our seventh in the negative rating, uh, sorry, Moving forward with a request will result in yet a negative operating margin, our seventh out of the last eight years, and will force NMC to either run afoul with our bondholders um, or result in a reduction or removal altogether of specific service lines that operate in a negative margin. Um, this would cause a delay in our in the service uh, to people of Franklin and Grand Isle counties. Deepen the delays outlined in the community health needs assessment, a specific focus and concern of at least one of the members of the Green Mountain Care Board. Drive our community to seek care elsewhere at clearly a higher cost, both to the patient and to the insurance carrier. All of the things that we're, we're trying to avoid. Um, both NMC and the Green Mountain Care Board. In conclusion, we believe that you should be considering from a strategic standpoint is how to encourage more Vermonters to seek their care at NMC. Clearly, if more Vermonters sought their care here, um, it would result in fewer delays uh, with our plan expansions, lower our overall insurance, uh, overall insurance costs for Vermonters and provide more timely care. I say all this because I really care. I care about what we do. I'm passionate about our work, about serving Franklin and Grand Isle counties. Um, and so are the, eight, the over 800 team members that walk in our doors every day. They're dedicated to serving this community. We often say that we don't serve patients here. We serve our friends. We serve our neighbors. We see them at Hannaford's. We see them at a shopping center. Um, we see them at family gatherings. This is deeply personal. And while we understand the pressures that are on you, we also understand that capping and restricting the lowest cost provider in Vermont will not result in uh, your goal 
which is to lower commercial rates. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much for your comments, Mr. Wright. Um, it's exactly why we wanted to open up this process before we deliberated so that we could get the feedback. Um, and one question I had, if that's okay, you said the lower productivity providers have lower base salary. And I thought if I remembered from your budget presentation, there was actually some effort to move out the lower productivity providers. And you, is, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, two things I want to mention. So in our budget presentation, we showed you a productivity report. That's a non-provider. That's staff. Um, where we maintain at the 75th percentile. On providers, you know, what we say is we we have a plan. This is, you know, either you're producing, if you get paid at the 50th percentile, you have to produce at the 75th percentile. If you're producing at the 35th percentile, remove your base, base salary. If we're in a situation where someone let's just say refuses to see patients, say the standard is seeing three patients an hour and they can't see more than a, you know, a, a patient and a half or something like that, unless it's an area um, where we, we can't control. So I, you know, I wanna be careful not to provide uniformity across all services. In the emergency department, we provide certain staffing because of the wild fluctuations and volumes. And we don't kind of, uh, if you'll say, we don't, build the church for Easter Sunday, if you will. We kind of manage those averages. So there's certainly times when they're up and they're below, but those are areas where, you know, managing productivity by provider is a, a little more complicated, but if it's in an outpatient service, so a, a, a clinic or a surgeon or something like that, then yeah, if someone's seeing half of where they are, we're going to adjust their base salary until it gets to the point where it's like, I don't know that that where you how you want to practice medicine is in line with how we need to do it here in the state of Vermont. So I think I answered your question, but please let me know if I didn't. No, you, d you did. And I, I recall that I just wanted to make sure from memory that I was remembering that correctly. Um, so thank you. You're welcome. Um, it does take a bit of time. You know, it's not something to say this quarter, we say, sure. but over the course of time. Right. And it's clear you put a lot of thought into your comments and prepared, and we appreciate you doing that. Um, any other public comment? Okay, Ms. Barabee. I believe, did Steph have her hand up earlier? I just want to make sure she, she saw. She did. No. I think it might have okay. been a question related to maybe one of the charts, but we can always send that to the staff later. Uh, Steph, are you on? We'll send it to the staff later if it's if it's needed. Great. Uh, Ms. Barabee, back to you. Um, Elaine, I think we can move on to the next presentation. I'll hop on. I, I believe that uh, we're having some computer difficulties on, on that end. So we were just uh, trying to figure out behind the scenes how to deal. I think that Kristen's going to share. Hey, thanks, Kristen. So we have the slides up. Okay, great. I think this is me. So I will go ahead and get started if everybody, well, I think Elena is working on some technical stuff. So um, good morning, everyone. I'm just going to dive right into Brattleboro. Um, we first wanted to talk about compliance. I know generally we were very uh, understanding because this year was pretty complicated, as we as we mentioned last Friday. However, we did want to note that Brattleboro's mission was moderately late. Their initial items were on time, but they did have to resubmit some of their adaptive sheets and workbook into August into hospital deliberation. So we did want to call that out. Uh, next slide, Kristen. Looking at their request, uh, we see that their NPR request is under the benchmark. It's at 2.5%, which it, uh, constitutes about negative 1% of the system that's over guidance. For their commercial rate, they're requesting 4.7%, which is about 3% of the system that's over guidance. And then for their operating margin, they're requesting a 0.5% operating margin, which as a whole is about 1% of the system.
Looking at their summary of their hospital justifications, this is for their commercial rate coming in over benchmark. Uh, they state that they're contending with stagnant or decreased rates from public payers. So they're arguing that these low public rates necessitate necessitates a higher uh, commercial rate. They note that Medicaid's not really increased their rates this year, and they argue that their Medicare slash Medicare Advantage has effectively reduced their rate given their proximity to out-of-state patients. Looking at their MPR growth by payer, we see that with the exception of 2018, where Medicare actually outpaced commercial, uh, every year since then, commercial has been their highest uh, MPR payer. We see that started in about 34.9 million in 2018, and that's grown pretty substantially to 72.1 million for budgeted for this uh, for FY25. Following that, we have Medicare, which has been relatively stable, took a decrease uh, from 2018 to 2019, but then slowly increased up to 35.8 million. And then finally, we see Medicaid at the bottom generally has been stable or lower. So they actually started in 2018 at 10 million, and that has dropped over time to just 6 million and 25 budgeted. Looking at their actuals versus their budgeted NPR, um, first looking at commercial, we see that it kind of fluctuates as we would potentially expect. So some years they have over budgeted, some years under. Um, and specifically in FY23, we see that they were just under, um, so pretty much right on. However, we see a different trend with Medicaid and Medicare. Um, with every year except for 2018 and 2023, these have been negative values. So they've been over budgeting where their actuals came in less than budget. Uh, so it seems that they've thought that they were going to get more money from public payers these years. Uh, however, again, in 23, this has this has changed and they have uh, just slightly under budgeted. So uh, that may indicate that they're kind of figuring that out and uh, projecting or budgeting a little bit closer to what is actually going to happen. Looking at their change in charge, we see from 2018 to 2022 it was pretty stable between 3.4% and 5.7%. However, we see a big spike in 23, up to 10.2%. This is, again, something that we've seen across many of the hospitals, um, and that's kind of a particular interest as we're kind of diving into 23 actuals. So overall, we see that they did have that similar spike in 23, up to 10.2% in their change in charge. However, that seems to have dropped in 24 and 25 back down to, to more typical levels uh, that we saw before 23. Looking at their expense trends, we see Brattleboro has had a downward trend year over year uh, of growth of their operating expenses. Um, so we see every year except for 23, they've been below the Vermont average. Um, and we've seen that this has been a pretty significant decrease from 10.1% in 2022 down to just 1.2% budgeted for 2025. Uh, looking at the right side, we can look at their top expenses as a percentage of their total operating expenses. For 25 specifically, we see that there's 59% of that's for labor, 28% other non-salary expense, about 1% for travelers, and 6% pharmaceuticals. Uh, in their narrative, they speak to 25 goals of remaining relatively flat on contracted services, reducing their supply expenses overall with better inventory, and rolling out new financial software scintillus for a potential transition to global budgeting. Then looking at that bottom table, what we see is that Broadborough has underestimated their labor budget with the exception of 24. So we see that they were over by 1% in 22 and 0.7% in 23. However, this is kind of flipped in 24 and it's now under by just over 1%. Um, and then for other non-salary expense, we see really large swings. So we see negative 5.5% in 22, and then this shoots back up to 29.5% over in 23. However, this seems to kind of have come back under control for 24, slightly under budgeting just by under 1%. Uh, their 24 projections are coming in a bit overall, um, a bit over at 3.3%. And from their INE, it appears as though travelers are what's really coming in well over budget for 24, uh, projected at least. And they do hope to bring this down to 24 budgeted levels of around a million for 2025. Looking more specifically at labor, we can look at their clinical and non-clinical budgeted split. So they're about 63% clinical FTEs versus 37% non-clinical. However, when we look at their distribution of additional FTEs, we see that this is 90% clinical, but just 10% non-clinical. So it seems to be a focus to uh, add in those clinical FTEs. Looking in their narrative, we see that their FTE growth is related to cardiology and podiatry primarily. 
um, and their contract labor is budgeted to remain flat once again, and, and they really seem to have a focus on shifting to FTE labor. Um, in general, majority of their additional spend in FY25 budget is um, investment in salaries, wages, and benefits, as well as contracted labor. Um, and then on the right side, I did just want to note that if there are some of those missing for 24. It's likely not actually a change of 8 or 12. Uh, it's probably just a reporting issue. So not that there were none in 24. It was likely just a reporting thing. So I just wanted to call that out. Overall, looking at their operating margin, uh, we look at in 22 and 23, they fell short of their operating margin budget, and they were pretty well below the Vermont average as well. So negative 3.8% in 22, and then negative 1.7% in 23. They are projecting to improve these margins for 24. They are still expecting to fall short about 200,000 uh, from breaking even and about 1 million overall from budget, and then hoping to get back into a positive operating margin in 2025 of about 0.5%. Looking at the right side on the table, looking at their operating revenue first, we see that they've underestimated revenue for the last three years. Uh, 24 is coming in over budget at 2.4%. And from their income statement, this appears to be from an uptick in other operating revenue. And this is offset by a pretty small decrease in total NPR and FPP. Their operating expenses tell a fairly similar story. They're projected to come in about 3.3% over budget, as we said in the last slide, and overall they typically go over budget for these. <clears throat> their overall takeaway is that we can see that consistently their expenses are outpacing revenue overages, and this has contributed to the deficit each year. For 2024, we did want to note that there, this overage gap is getting closer than in other years and operating margins pretty close to breaking even with the hope to continue this margin trend into the positive for 25. So this tells a pretty similar story as what we just were talking about. Um, we're seeing slow and steady improvement in that operating margin. Um, total margins been a little bit more of a fluctuation, but we are seeing them moving closer to that break even, and then ideally moving into a positive operating and total margin in 2025. Uh, and overall, no concerns with EBITDA as well. Looking at their day's cash on hand, we do see that they have dropped down to a budgeted amount in 25 of just around 100 days. Um, so this is right around the minimum recommended level. So we'd really like to see this not continue to decrease and, and potentially begin to build back up again. Looking at their days in patient account receivable, we see that they've had poor performance since 2022. Uh, so we definitely see a lot of room for improvement here. For their current ratio, so again, we'll start on the right side, looking at only assets over liabilities. Um, we do want this to be at about one, uh, just to, so that they're breaking even with their assets and liabilities. And we see Brattleboro is at that, and they're actually climbing closer towards that US median. Then switching back to the left side, we see that including funded depreciation, their current ratio goes way up, uh, well over the break even and the US median. Um, so this is good, again, especially with a hospital with an older age of plant. So in the next slide, we can look at their age of plant. So we see is overall, they're above the 75th percentile, um, with that exception of FY23 actuals. We, this is likely due to, re, to a reporting issue, and as such, we would expect that it is still above the 75th percentile, closer to that budgeted amount of over 15. Uh, so due to their age of plan, it's good to have that funded depreciation, and their budget does include uh, equipment purchases and updates in FY25. So that may account for that drop that we see in the budgeted age of plan. Uh, in FY25 to compared to 24. Looking at their long-term debt decapitalization, uh, again, not really a great number of this is where you should be, but generally want it to be below 50 and they're well below that, under 20% each year for the last three years. Uh, generally, there's no giant trends of it increasing, so it seems to be relatively stable. No concerns on that one. Looking at the debt service coverage ratio, we see that FY23 really skews this graph. Uh, however, for 24, we do see that they are above that standard minimum ratio for lenders. Um, so we'd like to see that continue to be above that line and, and consistently be above it for the next couple of years. Overall, looking at their summary of their financial health, we see that margins are slowly improving and we'd like to continue to see that growth. Um, their day's cash on hand has decreased to around 100, so that's something that we wouldn't want to see continue to decrease. And their day's in patient account receivable has poor performance, so definitely, again, something that we could see an improvement in. For their current ratio, this is solid with and without unrestricted funded depreciation, and they do have that. 
which is good due to that high age of plan over the 75th percentile. Their long-term debt to capitalization seems stable and relatively low um, for Vermont, and we'd like to see that debt service coverage ratio stabilize above the standard minimum ratio for lenders. Switching gears a little bit to price, uh, we would generally consider Brattleboro to be average priced. Again, their outpatient does uh, skew a little bit high, but we see this across Vermont hospitals. So overall, it's still pretty much average. And their inpatient prices actually appear to be a little bit on the lower end. So overall, we kind of consider them to be average. Their general higher relative price, again, indicates that they're likely not reimbursed as well for Medicare patients, which is why this, except for inpatient, skews higher uh, to like the higher nine and eight, seven deciles, uh, which again is expected given that they are not a critical access hospital. Looking at their assumptions for their public payer prices, from the narrative, they say that they adhere to the Medicare IPPS rate of 2.26% for traditional Medicare, um, and then didn't anticipate any increases for Medicaid. And this matches with their, with their most recent submission of their workbook, 0% for Medicaid and 2.3% assumption for Medicare, which is rounded. Looking at their payer mix, we see that their commercial is their largest with about 63.6%, followed by Medicare Advantage and traditional Medicare, just over 30%, um, and the Medicaid coming in a little over 6%. Looking at their changes to volume, um, Brattleboro definitely did this a little differently than what we've seen most other hospitals. Uh, it looks like they assumed a 4.5% increase in volume across payers. So regardless, with, with the exception of those fixed perspective payments, but across Medicaid, Medicare, Medicare Advantage, and commercial, they're just assuming a blanket 4.5% increase, uh, which overall contributes to a 3.3% increase in NPR. However, again, they're only requesting an increase of 2.5%. Uh, so we do want to note that this may be because it appears from their workbook submission that they are still using gross revenue rather than net. Um, if we have, if anyone has additional questions about that, Elena would be happy to answer those. Um, and it's just an assumption we're not entirely sure, but their, their workbook uh, submission was a little different from most of the other hospitals that we looked at. Looking at their projected versus their actual NPR, uh, starting with their commercial prices, so we see that their projected uh, has come in below what their actuals were. 21 was relatively close, but that gap widened in 22, and then looks like in 23 they've kind of closed the gap. We see a similar but kind of flipped uh, trend for their public payer prices, so just over in 21. Uh, for their projected compared to actual, and then their projected seemed to quite a bit higher in 22, but then again in 23, that seems that they've closed that gap, so may indicate that they're uh, improving their projections for actual and versus actual NPR. Looking at their budget history, so um, starting with their NPR and their FPP on the left, what we see is that in 2020 and 2022, their approved budget was less than they originally submitted. However, for all other years, 21, 23, and 24, their submitted was equal to approved. Um, and every year except for 23, their actuals have been less than budgeted. Looking at their operating expenses, we see a pretty similar trend of 20 2020 and 2022. Their approved was a little less than budgeted. However, their submitted and budgeted were equal for all other years. And then in all years except for 21, their expenses did exceed budget. Finally, looking at their operating margin on the right, 2020 approved was less than they submitted. Um, however, every other year it was almost identical, if not completely equal, except for in those years, 2021 through 2023, we see that they posted a uh, negative actual for operating margin. Finally, looking at uh, some efficiency metrics, looking at their clinical productivity, when Brattleboro reported this information to us, it only gave us whether it was above or below the 25th percentile. So approximately a third of their FTEs are below the 25th percentile, and we don't know the distribution of the remaining, how far above that 25th they are. Looking at their costs, uh, they're lower than the Vermont comparator groups for the average inpatient cost per Medicare discharge from 2019 to 2022. However, they're above their peer group costs from 2018 to 22, and their hospital only cost per patient is about 155% higher than their peer group. Looking at revenue, their NPR per discharge is higher than the Vermont median. Their compound annual growth is 9.2% from 2018 to 2022, comparing this to a national comparator median of about 6%. 
Their admin to clinical salary ratio has varied um, year to year. So sometimes they've been lower than their peer, sometimes higher. However, for the most recent year of data in 2022, they were at 19.6%, which was lower than their comparators. For their direct patient care FTEs, they were higher than their comparator groups. And for inpatient occupancy, they were below comparator groups. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will make the motion and then open up to any board member questions or comments. Um, I move to approve Rattleboro uh, Memorial Hospital's budget with modifications as follows. With fiscal year 25 MPR approved at a growth rate of not more than 2.5% over its fiscal year 24 approved budget with a commensurate reduction in operating expenses. With fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge and negotiated rate growth capped at 3.4% over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap reduced from 4.7%. With no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount and subject to all other standard budget conditions as approved by this board. Um, any board member comment or question for the staff? Any comment from the healthcare advocate? No comment, Mr. Chair. And I'll just say for the remaining hospitals today, we'll raise our hand if we have a comment. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And any public comment? Uh, Pam Davis. Mr. Davis, do you have a comment? Okay, uh, I'll turn to Mr. Doherty. Are you? Thank you, Chair Foster. It's good to see you. Uh, thank you, Emma, for that great rundown. I would just like one last point for consideration uh, as you deliberate, uh, especially the commercial rate increases. Um, we are a, the only Medicare dependent hospital in the state of Vermont. And so when you mentioned that we had budgeted for uh, a growth of 2.26% in uh, IPPS from Medicare, that's absolutely accurate. We do get that. What we don't get is any increase in the OPPS rate, which is the growing population in Medicare. Um, Medicare dependent hospitals across the country actually uh, run at a deficit, mostly because of not getting that OPPS rate increase, it's something that's being fought for in Washington, but no movement has happened. So I would love for you to consider us a bit differently because of not getting that OPPS increase. Uh, it's substantial, uh, and it's especially as we're moving towards more outpatient care. Uh, in addition, our provider tax is going up $500,000 next year and um, our disproportionate share payments are budgeted to be $40,000 less than last year. So uh, honestly, we've been sort of pushed into a corner of no other place to turn, but to look at um, increasing our uh, commercial rates um, by 4.7%. And again, we did not know that Medicaid was not going to increase their rates uh, until uh, we had basically submitted our budget for approval to our board. Uh, so that was a last minute change to go from following the budget guidance to exceeding it. And we apologize for that, but we believe we were left with no other alternative. But I, I thank you for listening to me. Thank you for making those comments, Mr. Doherty. Those, um, you, you raised those previously, and I'm glad that you flagged them again for us to make sure they're top of mind. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting them. Um, Mr. Davis, I see your hand is up. Okay, uh, hearing no other public comment, um, we can move on. Um, Janelle, I think you're up next. Good morning. Good yeah. morning. And I will be talking about NVRA. So, can everybody hear me okay? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, all right, so I'll just dive right in. So they are requesting uh, slightly over the guidance at 3.9% for their NPR, and it contributes to 0% of system, um, 0% over, uh, or 0% of the system overage, in, um, anyways. <laughs> Uh, commercial rate is slightly over at 4.5%, and it contributes to 1% of the overage of the system over guidance. And the positive operating margin is 0.7%, which is 1% um, of the system system's operating margin. We can move to the next slide. Um, so these are the hospital's core justifications as um, that they outlined in their narratives. So they need to invest as to why their overages are um, justified. So they need to invest in their facilities. NBRH asserts that they need to invest 29 million in their facilities. They've divided the investments between fiscal year 24 and 25. They need to increase access to pain management. They've hired more staff to expand access to their pain management clinic, which has increased projected volumes in NPR. Uh, without the change, changes to the pain management clinic, their NPR would only be 3.28%. Uh, and they've made considerable efforts to control expenses. They argue that they have taken robust efforts to combat, combat expense growth and they detail these efforts on page five of their narrative. And we can turn to the next slide. Uh, so this is just the NPR slash FPP by payer. Um, so commercial is their largest portion of NPR year over year, with the exception of 23, it appears. Um, but it's returned to being the largest NPR for projected 24, and it's continued an upward trend for 25. Medicare is the second largest. It's increased at a more moderate rate versus commercial, with the exception of the spike in 23. And then Medicaid is the bottom line, well, besides the disproportionate share payments. Um, it was flat, it jumped a little bit in 21, and now it's dipped, but it's projecting to increase again in 24 to just below um, that peak in 21. And we can move to the next slide. So well, historically, they've been um, they've under budgeted commercial in years outside of it looks like eighteen and twenty three. Those came in over budget. Um, Medicaid has been under budgeted, with the exception of twenty and twenty three. Medicare has been over budget for twenty and twenty one. Oh, I'm sorry, not twenty one. Medicare has been over yeah twenty and twenty one, and overall they've been um, over budget in 20 and 23. We can move to the next slide. Uh, so this is commercial NPR versus change in charge. So you can see that change in charge has change in charge it's hovered around 3%. It's kind of bounced around that 1%. Um, but it jumped up to 10.8% in 2023 and has been decreasing since then, but it still has not returned to that 3%. Um, typically, NPR budget has been projected to steadily increase. Um, actuals typically have come in over with the exception of 2023, but 2024 is projecting to narrowly come in slightly higher again. And we can go to the next slide. So NPRH has had a pretty linear downward trend of year-over-year -year growth of operating expenses and hopes to keep that expense growth at 2.4% for 2025. Some large contributors include labor, other non-salary expense, travelers, and pharmaceuticals. Um, the other purchase services, miscellaneous, that may be due to transitioning to a new cloud-based storage system which they said was more of a cost shift um, rather than an additional expense. Um, and historically, they've underestim underestimated their labor expense, but after 2022, it hovered around a 2% overage. And we can move to the next slide. 
but some labor call outs um, in the 25 budget, they assume there will be fewer open positions for nurses, other clinical staff, and non-clinical personnel as a result of efforts to recruit, retain, and grow the workforce. And a corresponding assumption is a decrease in travelers and locum tenants to cover critical vacant positions. Um, and in the follow-up questions to the hospitals, I just wanted to note that they um, noted that zero-based budgeting was used primarily primarily in clinical areas to determine appropriate core staffing levels. This reduced the number of budgeted FTEs in some clinical departments. They also are implementing some staffing recommendations that were included in the Applied Management Services report prepared in 2022. And we can move to the next slide. So NDRH has managed positive operating margins with the exception of projected 24. They attribute the variance to increased volume in pain management and an accounting adjustment um, that might be to do with revenues. Um, in 2025, they hope to return to a modest 0.7 operating margin. Um, NVRH has underestimated revenue, revenue for the past three years. However, this year they are expecting to come within 1% of the original budget. And from the income statement, this is mostly attributed to other operating revenue coming in higher than expected from grant income and additional 340B revenue. Um, operating expenses are projected to come in about 2.8% over budget for 24. NVRH has historically underestimated operating expense. And overall, in 22, operating expenses overages exceeding the revenue overages. However, NVRH had enough margin budgeted that they were able to still have a positive margin. Um, in 23, actuals were favorable to budget. However, in 24, the expense gap just exceeded any ability to maintain a positive margin. And we can move to the next slide. Um, so overall, it seems pretty stable. Uh, we'd like to see continued improvement in margins as we, uh, we try to get back to pre-COVID 3% for operating margin. I think that's just overall for, for hospitals. Um, NVRH has been able to make a positive R operating margin with the exception of 24, where they're projecting a 0.7% loss. Total margin in 22 also dipped below zero to 3.2%. Otherwise, um, these numbers are above zero, which is, which is good. And then we can move to the next slide. So we can see that NDRH has dipped below um, 100 days cash on hand. So we'd like to see this not decrease further, if possible, and maybe improve a little bit. For the days and patient accounts receivable, it looks to be about average and seems to be steadily decreasing towards a high performance. So that's good. And moving to the next slide. So to the left, we have the funded depreciation. Um, we can see that they are very well above one. And without the funded depreciation, um, NDRH is still above one, which is good. They are declining a little bit, but still above that 1.0. And then moving to the next slide. So NVRH's age of plant has dropped from right about the 75th percentile to between the 25th and 75th. It's dropped, um, though it looks like they are budgeting an increase in 2025. Um, they do have multiple capital expenditure projects, including routine capital cost, as well as, as um, CON and non-CON projects. So, and then we can jump to the next slide. Um, so looking at the long-term debt to capitalization, looking at the trends here, it seems to have jumped for fiscal year 25. Um, this could be the start of a upward trend or it could be an outlier. Um, typically we wanna see, there's no consistent 
consensus on what a good decapitalization number is, but um, the general cons consensus seems to be less than 50%. So they're maintaining that, um, but it is jumping up to nearly 30% in 25. Uh, for the debt service coverage ratio, it's been above the standard minimum for lenders, um, which is looks like 1.25. Uh, so that is considered pretty strong. We can move to the next slide. So the summary of their financial health, margin seems stable overall. I uh, would like to see continued improvement. Days cash on hand has dropped below 100. Days in pa patient accounts receivable has average performance and is trending towards high performing. Current ratio is solid and they have unrestricted funded depreciation. Age of plant is between the 25th and 75th percentile. There's been a slight uptick in long-term debt capitalization for the fiscal year 25 budget. And the debt service coverage ratio is consistently above standard minimum for lenders. So we can move to the next slide. So generally, um, Northeastern appears to be average priced. Outpatient standardized prices is a bit high, but we see this across Vermont hospitals. Their lower relative price may indicate that they are reimbursed well for Medicare patients, which is why their relative price is lower than standardized price, which is um, that sometimes happens with critical access hospitals. And we can move to the next slide. So for public payer prices, what did they assume for Medicare slash Medicaid price reimbursement increase? Um, from the narrative, as a critical access hospital, NVRH receives cost-based reimbursement for inpatient and outpatient services. Rates will increase based on cost increases for those services. Also from the narrative, the budget assumes zero Medicaid rate increases for all services. And then from the workbook, they indicate 0% increase for Medicaid and 0.7 for Medicare. And we can go to the next slide. So NVRH requested an NPR increase of 3.9%, and according to their workbook, 2.3% of this will come from increased volume. Um, and then if we look at the, the table to the right, um, this is about, they, they're pretty equal throughout, um, but with 0% for FPP. And we can jump to the next slide. So in Northeastern's case, the commercial revenue is not consistently over or underestimated. We can see actuals come in over or over in 2022 and under in 21 and 23. Uh, public payer revenue, rev, um, sorry, public payer projections have consistently come in over actuals. I guess it's um, or actuals have come in under what the projections have been. So, but that gap has been pretty narrow for 21 and 23. And we can jump to the next slide. So their budget has only slightly, has only been reduced from submitted in 20 and 24 for NPR. Typically actuals come in higher than budgeted with the exception of 2020. For operating expense, they have not been adjusted from submitted to approved with the exception of 24. Typically, actuals come in higher than budgeted. Um, budget margins have only been reduced in 2020. Actuals have been variable, coming in lower in 20 and 22, and coming in higher than budget in 21 and 23. And we can jump to the next slide. So for efficiency, um, clinical productivity, 32.6 clinical FTEs below the 25th percentile. 82.6% clinical FTEs are below the 50th percentile. And pain management clinic is at the 39th percentile. For cost, they're higher than Vermont comparator groups for the average inpatient cost per Medicare discharge from 2018 to 21. But in 22, it's comparable. Costs are consistently lower 
in their peer group. For revenues, compound annual growth rate of NPR per adjusted discharge from 2018 to 22 is 6.65% compared to the critical access hospital state total of 4.35% and the critical access hospital national median of 5.66%. Admin to clinical salary ratio is notably lower than other Vermont critical access hospitals and the Vermont median. And inpatient occupancy, um, they have higher rates than comparators. Okay, and then we're moving to the next slide. Um, here's a slide that ties into 23 enforcement for NVRH. Um, NVRH would be liable for up to 2.1 million enforcement due to coming in high on the NPR and FPP in 23 at 1.9% over. Um, but if we jump to the next slide. Uh, the recommendation is no enforcement and the rationale is financial health could not reasonably sustain a downward adjustment to commercial rate. And I believe um, the next slide concludes the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Figario. <clears throat> uh, I move to approve NVRH's budget with modifications as follows. One, with fiscal year 25 MPR approved at a growth rate of not more than 3.5% over its fiscal year 24 approved budget, reduced from 3.9%, and a commensurate reduction in operating expenses. Two, with fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge, negotiated rate growth capped, at 3.4% over fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap reduced from 4.5% with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount and subject to all other standard budget conditions as approved by this board. I'll second. Any board member discussion on the motion or questions for the staff? And I'll open it up to public comment on the motion. Mr. Tester, good morning. Good morning, Chair Foster. Beautiful morning out there. It's nice to get through a week with very little rain in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, first off, I want to thank you all for the opportunity for public comment. Uh, we are very concerned with the proposed motion if accepted um, as languaged. Like Northwestern Medical Center, uh, we do believe that this is an equity issue. And while Vermont is one of the oldest states in the nation when it comes to demographics, in our health service area, we're caring for some of the oldest, sickest, and poorest Vermonters. We believe that our budget as submitted is both defensible and reasonable. And while we appreciate the tremendous pressures that you are all dealing with, we urge you to approve our budget as we submitted it, including the submitted NPR growth and commercial rate increases. We are caring for our friends, families, and neighbors here, and the budget we've submitted supports that mission, including expanding access to paying services throughout the region. We do know how important expanding services is and access to all of you. And that's why we have made the steps we have to address those, those issues. If this motion is approved as proposed by your staff, I'm concerned it will further erode our ability to meet this community's health care needs. And none of us want that. So please consider approving the budget as originally submitted. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, any other public comment? Um, Mr. Davis, I'm going to try you again because your hand's raised, but I think it was just a remnant. All right. Um, so uh, if you have public comment, obviously you can come in via uh, writing as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and I will turn it back to staff. I believe it's uh, Springfield next. Oh, no, sorry. We may have the, do we have the motion language for enforcement for NVRH? Uh, no, no motion language for enforcement as staff's recommendation is to take 
no action. Um, if the board chooses to consider something else, then it would be easy to draft up language. Do we need to make a motion and have a finding for no action? No, um, but uh, no, yeah. Okay, um, then we can move on and if board members want to later suggest or make a motion uh, other, you know, inconsistent with the staff's recommendation, that would be fine, but otherwise we can move on. Okay. Um, I'm presenting for Springfield today. Can you all hear me okay? Thumbs up? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, as you can see, um, these are the three core elements of their requests. Uh, they came in under guidance for their commercial rate and their operating margin, um, but pretty substantially over guidance uh, on their NPR request. Um, this overage is 13%, but it comprises about 4% of the overage on system, or um, yeah, cumulatively $69 million. Next slide. Uh, to justify their NPR request, uh, they issued one rationale. Um, they said they, one main rationale, uh, they said they want to recapture patients that are leaving their service area uh, and increase access to certain services. Uh, in their narrative, they argue that only 2.4% of the NPR increase would be due to price and the rest would be due to utilization. Um, they need to recapture patients that have been a uh, loss for a variety of reasons, including their uh, bankruptcy filing in uh, mid-2019 um, and expand access to certain primary and specialty care services. Next slide. Uh, this conveys the revenue trends over the last several years. As you can see, the public revenue trends are relatively flat. Um, Medicare uh, from 16 million in uh, 2018 to about 17.8 million in uh, budgeted 25. Medicaid uh, 7.5 million 2018 to 6.8 million in budgeted 25. Uh, and commercial trends, it's it's a little stranger, follows a bit of a V or a parabola. Um, and you see sharply decreasing commercial revenues up till 2020. Um, as a reminder, they uh, declared bankruptcy in mid 2019, and then since then have been uh, steadily creeping upwards uh, from 19 million in 2020 to 43.5 in budgeted 25. Next slide. Uh, again, this conveys their actual versus budget NPR. Uh, red values actuals are lower than budget. Black values actuals are higher than budget. Uh, as you can see, they they've had a harder time than other hospitals predicting their NPR. Um, in recent year, they recent years they've over over predicted Medicare by large margins, uh, twenty eight percent in twenty one, twenty seven point nine percent in twenty two, one hundred twenty eight percent in twenty three. Um, they've similarly uh, under predicted commercial, and in, um, in uh, certain years. Um, overall, these seem to somewhat balance each other out, um, and they come favorable to budget. Um, by a modest percentage, 2.9% uh, in 2022 and 1.6% in 23. Next slide. Uh, this displays their uh, change in charge in NPR over time. Looking at NPR, we see a similar story as the previous slide, which is a bit of a V, uh, decreasing NPR to 2020 and then steadily increasing upwards since then. Um, their change in charge has been all over the map, as high as 10% in 2019, then down to zero, four, 8.3, 10, six, and then um, a requested 3.5. This would be the uh, lowest change in charge that they've received since uh, fiscal year 2020. Next slide. Uh, so Springfield Hospital has relatively low expenses compared to the uh, Vermont average. Um, it was 7.6% 2022, down to 3.4, 23, 6.3. Um, it's expected to uptick a little bit in the next year, 7.6%. It'd be the first time in recent history that they've been over the Vermont average, um, but still relatively low overall. Um, on the right, you can see a breakdown of their operating expenses. Uh, most things remain relatively constant. Labor costs remained uh, between 57, 59% of the budget. 
Um, on the bottom right, you can see overages from their budget based on their income and expense reports. Um, it seems that the major drivers for any overages include labor and traveler costs. Um, for fiscal year 25, they hope to decrease traveler expenses, but only by about 7.8% um, due to continued needs for travelers and respiratory care, diagnostic imaging, inpatient care, mental health care, uh, and several other service areas. Next slide. Um, they budgeted for a pretty substantial increase, increase in uh, FTEs, um, but mostly in clinical FTEs. Uh, this accounts for, uh, according to their submissions, about 78% of the additions. Um, and as they specified, they're continuing to look for uh, different options to expand care in cardiology, bring more cardiology services back to the hospital, um, and also um, recruiting for uh, gynecology and inpatient psychiatric staffing. Next slide. Um, so as you can see, their margins have been um, a little bit inconsistent as well. They had a very strong margin in 2022, 5.4%, but since then have been below the Vermont average. They posted negative margin in 2023, um, barely broke even in 2024, and are aspiring to a 1.4% margin in the next year. Um, if you look to the right-hand side of the screen, you can see overages uh, in their budgeted revenues and budgeted expenses. Um, overall, they've, they've underestimated their revenues over the past few years uh, by a large amount in 2022, smaller amounts since then. Similar story for expenses. They've underestimated um, by large amount in 2022 and by relatively smaller amounts since then. Um, these things have relatively balanced out, so their operating margin has been mostly positive over the last few years. Next slide. Um, these are their main financial metrics, operating margin, total margin, and EBITDA over the last few years. Uh, as you can see, mostly in the healthy range, um, only in the red for 2023, um, uh, and otherwise uh, relatively healthy operating margins. Not much of a boost from their total margin, but sometimes a little bit. Um, in 24, they got a 0.6% boost from their total margin. EBITDA also in the, in the healthier range. Next slide. Uh, these are their first two uh, main financial metrics, their day's cash on hand and their PAR. Um, both of these are more in a concerning range. Their day's cash on hand has been very low since at least 2022. Um, actuals have decreased from about 70 to about 50 in 2025. They're budgeted to the high 50s, but still very, very low. We'd recommend a minimum level of around 100 days. Um, on the right, their PAR, again, an indication of their cash flow, has been in the poor range and uh, overall worsening over the last few years. So that's something we'd also want to see turn around. Next slide. Uh, this is a visualization of their current ratio. Uh, they do not have unrestricted funded depreciation. So we only have one uh, graph on the slide. Um, they have been hovering a little bit below the U.S. median for current ratio, which is around 1.7. The U.S. average is higher. That's around 2.79. In general, we consider uh, 1.5 to 3 to be in the good range, and they're um, really just breaking above 1.5. So getting low, but nothing too concerning at the moment. Next slide. Um, this is a visualization, visualization of their age of plant. Um, as you can see, their age of plant is very, very high, uh, very well very above high. the 75th percentile. Um, is anyone's uh, volume on? Can you all hear me okay? Okay, I'm just making sure there's no, no reverb. Um, yeah, their age of plant is very high. Uh, however, they wrote to us stating that they believe this is overstated. Um, they expect to show a decrease in age of plant by the end of 24 and 25, which is not yet reflected in their uh, balance sheets. Uh, while this correction will likely have an impact, um, we still expect their age of plan to be above the 75th percentile. So certainly a point of concern and something to think about going forward. Um, hey Noah, I am getting a little feedback now. Okay, um, let me see. If... 
Anyone is unmuted. Is this better? Can you all hear me? That's better. Okay. Yeah, you can you can cut in if you start to hear reverb again. Um, and finally, their last two financial health metrics, long-term debt to capitalization and their debt service coverage ratio. Um, their long-term debt to capitalization is higher than most Vermont hospitals. It was as high as nearly 80% in 2022. Um, thankfully, it's decreased a little bit since then, um, but still remains on the high end of the spectrum around uh, 30 to 40% and is budgeted around 30%. Um, their debt service coverage ratio, um, relatively healthy. Um, we saw a big dip in 2023 where they were approaching uh, the minimum ratio for lenders, which again is 1.25, but has started to creep upward since then. So a summary of financial health, um, some concerning metrics. Um, their margins for FY24 are projected to be positive, but barely positive. Their day's cash on hand has been very low historically, and their PAR is in the poor range. Um, their current ratio seems okay, but there's no unrestricted funded depreciation. Um, the age of plant, it's difficult to say. They are um, uh, told us that they plan to issue a correction, but it's likely that it'll still be high. Um, and their long-term debt to capitalization and debt service coverage ratio are less concerning, but still on the higher end of the spectrum when compared, compared to some Vermont hospitals. Next slide. Um, as for their price data, um, Springfield appears to be low priced. Uh, they're outpatient standardized price. If you look at the right-hand side of the screen, um, is above the US median, but that's actually around average for Vermont hospitals in the sixth price decile. Um, in their inpatient uh, facility, inpatient price, inpatient facility, outpatient facility, are all very, very low. Um, and their relative price is also low if you move to the left-hand side of the screen, which again indicates that they're reimbursed well for Medicare, makes sense uh, because they're a critical access hospital. Next slide. Um, this part of the presentation, we delve into their budget assumptions. Um, for public payer assumptions, um, they uh, didn't specify a Medicare rate in their narrative. Um, but they specified a 0% increase for Medicaid. Um, in their workbook, um, a little bit different, somewhat similar, they said 1.1% for Medicaid and 1.9% for Medicare. Next slide. Um, for their volume assumptions, um, their payer mix is on the left-hand side of the screen. This is their projected payer mix for the end of this year. Um, majority commercial, about 64%. Um, a smaller amount Medicare, a little over 21%, and a smaller amount Medicaid, around 14%. On the right-hand side of the screen, we have their expected changes to volume, not their payer mix, so it's the increase in utilization. Um, this is data that's submitted to us in their workbooks. Um, and you can see across the board, they're projecting pretty significant uh, volume increases in the double digits for every payer type, except for traditional Medicare, 12% um, for Medicaid, 13.4 for Medicare Advantage, 13.9 for commercial, and uh, an increase in FPPs. Um, they attribute a pretty large uh, increase in NPR just to increase in volume. Uh, this aligns with their core justification of their budget, which is that they're trying to expand access to services, um, bring back patients who are leaving their HSA for care. Um, and as a, summer, as a reminder, they request an NPR increase of 13%, according to this workbook calculation, which they provide to us, about 12.3 would come from um, an increase in utilization. Next slide. Um, so this depicts their uh, projected versus actual NPRs from 2021 to 2023, as well as projections for 2024. Um, these have been all over the place. Um, it somewhat makes sense. They've had a much higher rate of NPR growth since COVID uh, as they've been trying to expand um, since their uh, bankruptcy filing in uh, 2019. So we hope that, you know, in the future, as they get into a more stable financial footing, that these lines will align a little bit more.
Um, this slide is a summary of their recent budget history, um, their requests, the requests that have been approved, and how their actuals came in compared to those two things. Um, so Springfield has had their submitted NPR approved uh, in 2020 and 2023. Um, the boards adjusted it in the three other years. Um, and actual revenues have typically come in a bit lower than um, what they requested. Uh, the boards approved their operating expenses for 2020, 22, as well as 23. They reduced them in 2021 and 24. Um, and actual expenses have typically come in uh, a bit higher than budgeted. Um, and the boards approved all margins for every year except 2022. Um, operating margins have typically come in a little bit under budget. Um, this is a slide, or really a set of slides I added to address um, their justification that they're, they've been losing patients and they're trying to um, bring back patients that have been leaving their HSA. Um, so this depicts their HSA outflows from 2017 to 2021. Uh, so just keep in mind the data is a bit dated. Um, and you can see for both their inpatient and hospital market share, um, they lost um, a significant amount of revenue during that time. Um, so uh, of HSA spending on hospital care, uh, it decreased from 78.7% to 65% from 2017 to 2021. Of outpatient hospital care, 81.7% to about 70% from 2017 to 2021. So that's a decrease of um, over 10% in both areas. Next slide. Um, this is an inverse way of looking at the issue. It's um, where are Springfield patients originating? And as you can see, they're uh, modestly, have modestly lost uh, both revenue and discharges um, from local patients over the period of concern from 2017 to 2021. Next slide. And a similar story for outpatient charges and outpatient services. They, um, in the period leading up to their bankruptcy and following it, they uh, lost a significant amount of patients from their service area. Uh, this is a summary of different efficiency metrics. Um, their rate request came in under guidance, so they weren't required to provide any clinical productivity data. Um, the rest of the efficiency metrics are, um, you know, convey a bit of a mixed picture. Um, they're low cost, lower to all comparative groups uh, for average inpatient cost per Medicare discharge. Um, their revenue uh, data is a bit complicated because, again, revenue was actually decreasing for a little bit and then has been sharply increasing there since then. Um, and their admin to clinical ratio is less consistent, but most recently posted um, about at the uh, Vermont median for critical ac access hospitals. Um, and with that, I'll pass it back to you, Owen, or you, Elena, to read the motion language and take comment. Thank you, Noah. Um, I move to approve Springfield Hospital's budget with modifications as follows. With fiscal year 25 NPR approved at a growth rate of not more than 6% over its fiscal year 24 approved budget, reduced from 13% and a commensurate reduction in operating expenses. With fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge and negotiated rate growth capped at 2.2% over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap, with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount and subject to all of their standard budget conditions as approved by this board. A second. Any board member discussion or comments for the staff at this time? It's one thing I wanted to point out, Noah, you mentioned that um, Springfield outpatient price was average for Vermont. Um, I think it's actually quite a bit low average. I get the average brand standardized price at $451, or Springfield's $374. And there's several hospitals between Springfield and the average. I, I don't know the percent below the average, but definitely several, several percent. Okay. 
And any public comment? Mr. Adcock, good morning. Thank you, Chair Foster. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Well, first, I'd like to thank, uh, thank you, Chair Foster, and the board members for uh, the work that you do. We recognize and appreciate the work that you're doing and the fact that we need to uh, implement re reform in Vermont. And we look forward to participating in that effort and supporting those efforts. I um, want, want to thank Noah for presenting our statistics and for pointing out the fact that our hospital does have a rather unique situation due to the financial difficulties that we have faced, um, both going into Chapter 11, going through the pandemic, and now as we've exited Chapter 11, stabilizing and move the, moving the hospital forward. Um, and, th and that makes some of the predictions that we make for budgeting and projecting very challenging because we've had a lot of variability um, going forward. Um, but it's difficult for us to be, we think it's difficult to compare us to our colleagues because of this unique history we have and the financial uh, realities that we faced here. Um, I, I do want to point out that our budgeted, projected budget supports uh, the needs identified in our community health needs assessment, which is increased access and affordability. Our prices are low and favorable compared to our peers, both at the state and national average. We've done a lot of work to reduce our expenses, and now we need to rebuild volume lost during our financial struggles and during COVID. And we still believe strongly that this is our path to success, is to rebuild our volume and recapture that. And I will point out, Appreciate slide 96 that staff put that together to show the changes in our volume and market share. And I'll point out that those slides do not include three significant hospitals that happen to be in New Hampshire that where, where I believe if those hospitals were in those slides, it would show even a more significant change in our market share. Um, so we've done a lot to just pointing that out. So we've done a lot to reduce our expenses. Our strategy is to work on reinvesting in our hospital and um, um, our year over year results, which we showed in our original budget presentation show that those efforts are now beginning to work. Um, so the staff recommendation of 6.6% 6 .6 NPR growth, if that's approved, then that'll, the the uh, corresponding reduction in expenses will be $4.2 million. And uh, meeting that goal would require us to hold expenses essentially flat from the current fiscal year with only a 0.9% increase in projected increases. And that would allow virtually no allowance for any inflation. So we believe that that's pretty drastic. Uh, we are at minimum staffing levels, and in many departments, we're at fixed staffing levels. So a reduction in volume will not result in lower cost in those areas. Um, our wages are already at, at low levels, and we need additional funding to remain competitive and, and to continue to recruit and try to reduce the traveler expenses in our hospital. Um, you know, a reduction of $4.2 million will require us to take a hard look at our major service lines and consider, you know, what um, what are the what are the needs and access points in our in our neighborhood here. Um, so, and also, I just want to point out, finally, we've had really low expense growth since 2020. Um, so we're the sixth out of 14 hospitals for the lowest and. Um, that shows that we've really, over over that period of time since 2017, we've only had a 2.1% average annual NPR growth. So um, for a growth of 13% versus a benchmark of 3.5, you know, we'd like for you to pre please consider that. I know that sounds high, but 10.6% of this is projected recapture of market. Um, but we're also talking low numbers, a percentage of, sorry, um, so our, even though we have higher NPR growth on a percentage basis, the absolute amount of that dollars is low. So talking about our financial sustainability, we do, op we must operate with a margin and continue to build our days of cash and our cash reserves. 
you know, that's one of our challenges here now. And we asked that the budget be approved as submitted with a 13% NPR increase. Uh, we trust, we trust, uh, we hope that you trust us and that we're continuing to work very hard every day to bring our hospital back, um, you know, to pre pandemic financial and quality performance. And Chair, I did have comments on two other slides for questions or clarifications, and I don't know if you'd like for me to pose those now or submit those in writing after the presentation. Um, why don't we do both, if you don't mind? I wouldn't mind hearing what, what the questions are or the comments are on specific slides, and then we can get back to you when Ms. Barabia has time, but, but yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect. I'll go ahead on, thank you. On slide 80, I just wanted to clarify the change in charges. Um, it shows 3.5%, and our budget actually is a 5.5% increase in overall charge charge with, um, with of course, 2.2% of that going to commercial revenue. So we're not, we're, we were confused about the 3.5% number. Um, on slide, uh, 82 with the labor expenses, we do have quite a few unfilled positions in there th that should be considered. And then slide 96, I uh, want to point out again that the um, that the three primary New Hampshire hospitals where people from our service area go are not included in that data. So thank you, Chair Foster and board out for allowing me to make those comments. Great, thank you. And uh, Ms. Lodges, could you pull up slide 80 real quick? I just wanted to see it. That was the first one Mr. Adcock referenced. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Any other public comment? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is Ham. Can I speak on the phone? Yes, I can hear you, please. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, there's been a, I can't, a huge amount of ground covered in the last 10 days in your board. Uh, all very interesting. I disagree with a whole lot of it, but I've got a whole book to lay that out. There's two pieces that I just don't understand what you're thinking. One is, what's the point of approving an NPR, okay, of a certain amount, let's say, whatever, 6%. You've done this in a couple already. Uh, approving an NPR and then capping the commercial ask so that you just cannot, uh, so that so that they can't possibly get that. Um, I, I don't know. I'm just not sure what the thinking is. I don't know why you would do that. They, they, you can. The only way you can get, you, the only way you can get over Medicare and Medicaid is the with the cost shift. You're going to have to go to commercial, and that's then that's. So I don't understand that. The second thing I don't understand is uh, when you're looking at national metrics. The the fact of the matter is that. National metrics are worthless unless you are, a, unless they are age adjusted. Vermont is the second oldest state in the United States. Like Maine is, Maine is, you go to Maine, everybody's tottering around. Um, it's very old. We're just very old. Those, those, uh, that fact, it, so that when you're using a national metric, if you don't age adjusted, then that, uh, that national metric has no real meaning at all. That's my view. In the, but those are my two questions. Thank you. Sure, thanks, and thanks for calling in. Um, I don't mind actually responding to the first one, uh, if you don't mind muting. Um, it, just because it's sort of relevant to the discussion that we're having today, um, hospitals can certainly hit their NPR when they don't get their commercial rate increase that they requested. In fact, we saw that this year with some of the enforcements, a couple of the hospitals did not get the commercial rate they requested and yet went over the NPR caps. So I don't think it's necessarily a fact that if you don't give the commercial rate, the NPR can't be achieved. In fact, we've seen it <laughs> exceeded. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that's actually true, at least not as a binary concept, um, but thank you. I, 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 can I, is there an answer to the second question? Um, you know, I think that takes probably a little bit more discussion with the staff, but there's a couple different answers to it, which is we use the best peer reviewed gold standard data we can. And there isn't what you're alluding to doesn't simply exist. You have to age adjust every single state. The other component to it is you'd also have to health adjust it. 
So like cost data, you'd have to health adjust. It doesn't matter if you're older, if people are healthy, and you'd also have to adjust it for uh, how much utilization there is. So if a state is low cost Medicare, but it's very low Medicare access, it's not really that relevant to age adjust it alone. There's other contributing factors. So I think with any of the data we look at, they're all important things that we consider, um, but there's not one metric that I'm looking at that drives my decision. And as you can see from these hearings, there's an immense amount of data and facts and information that we have to consider. But I understand your point on the age adjusted. I just don't think it's that clean and there's many other conflicting factors we have to look at. But thank you for raising the point. Uh, is that, am I, I don't know. I don't have my, can I still be heard? You can. Yes. Can I Can I follow up can with I, one comment before we move on on the age adjustment? I think it also depends on the metric you're looking at. For example, the RAND data has already taken that into account. Yes. So it is essentially age adjusted by some of the other um, acuity adjustment that they're doing. So it really depends on the metric we're talking about and whether and if it makes sense to adjust it. But thank you, Ham. Uh, We've all taken. Oh, uh, can I, can I, I am, who was I talking to? I'm, I'm not on my computer anymore. So now I'll like, was that Noah? That's <laughs> Elena Barabee. <laughs> uh, so and, did and, I, was oh, Noah Chair talking? Foster. Okay. I, uh, okay. I, I, okay. Just, just FYI, I disagree with everything you've said, uh, but that's, we're used to that. We've been doing it for a couple of years. Thank you. We appreciate the feedback anyway. I think it makes us better, so thank you. Um, I had one question on the programming, seeing it's 11.07, um, that it might actually make sense to take a hospital out of order um, so that we can continue on and then take a lunch break after. But I wanted to make sure um, the hospital was here. And what I wanted to do was to do CPMC next so Dr. Merman could be dismissed and we could get through CVMC and then take um, a lunch break. Uh, so I'm just going to open up the question to the public here and ask if there's anyone from CVMC here and whether or not that would be OK with them. Is there anyone from CVMC or representing CVMC? Um, Kim, hey, how are you? Good morning, Chair Foster. I'm here and I'm yeah. just checking to see if my president can join as well. Okay. Do you want us to? I don't have to take it out of order if that's inconvenient. I'm checking with my team right now. Kim, why don't we do this? We, we can just take a five minute break or we'll come back at 11.15. And just, um, do you have Ms. Barabee's email? I do, thank you, yes. Um, that would, five minutes would be great so I can get my team together. Thank you. Yeah, just just email Ms. Barabee and if that's okay. And if you don't want to do it out of order, that's totally fine. Just email her and we'll take a break till 11.15. Thank you, Chair Foster. All right, thanks. We'll go off the record.